Good evening all, and welcome to my humble abode if you're new. Tonight we have five true or big scary horror stories. Potentially some of the stories might be a reach at what you consider to be our big stories, but nonetheless, let me know down below if you have ever experienced anything like these. If so, I would love to feature it in a video. Anyway, before you all get too antsy and click away, I would just like to say my mic is on its way out and due to this I won't be able to record any more stories for a while. Anything you hear in the next week is pre-recorded stuff and I don't know when I'll be able to afford another mic so for that I do apologise. Anyway, let's begin. Number 1 There's an abandoned and boarded up World War II fort in the southern part of Belgium that we often sneak into with the scouts. Getting in there requires scaling a sheer wall where we've placed anchoring points for ropes and climbing gear next to a relatively busy road. So you're being super quiet, making no light and cowering every time a car passes by so he doesn't spot you in his light. The atmosphere is set. The moment you enter it, it's like diving into water. Sound stops and the entire place is at a constant 14 degrees Celsius with a slight breeze passing through. The tunnel is barely large enough for me, slightly broader than average person, to pass without turning my body sideways. The tunnel is just high enough to work up a decent gate while hunched over. If someone ahead of you blocks a passage for a moment, the breeze stops and it feels like the entire tunnel network takes a breath. Because of the way the tunnels are constructed, they echo in such a way that your own footsteps seem to be coming from behind you. They also seem to take one more step than you do when you stop. Of course, we don't allow the guys and gals to take any source of light in there, so it's pretty scary overall. So, I'm in there, posted at a side passage to ensure everyone takes the same path and doesn't get lost. I go in first, before any of the claimers arrive so they don't know there are friendly faces in there to help them. I'm in there for a while, just waiting for the first to come by, when I see a dancing little light coming down the long hallway. I quietly settle back in my nook and wait for whoever was smart enough to hide some matches and take them away. The light quietly bops closer when I realise there aren't any footsteps accompanying it. I poke my head around the corner just in time to see it disappear. I hear no footsteps still. I settle back and wait some more. When I realise I do hear some scuffling, very faint, breathing noises but still very faint. I become aware of a wet heat coming from right in front of me, with a faint smell of… person, sweat or dirt. Suddenly I realise there's someone there, right in front of me, inches from my face. The breathing stops suddenly. Whatever it is, is aware of me as well. Whatever or whoever it is, we're both holding our breath, both acutely aware of each other. It takes ages. I'm sitting there, unable to move, speak or breathe properly. The wet heat passes and some minutes later I become aware of a very faint light coming from my right side, which soon dissipates and leaves. Some time later still, I hear the familiar stomping of combat boots coming down the hallway from my left. I stop the person, tell them to keep following the passageway and take the first right they come to. Out of curiosity, I ask who went in first. No one. He went in first. Number 2 I once was alone at Moorgate Station in London after staying for a few after work drinks with my buddy who also works in Central. It was around 10pm so I left the pub and walked to the station and found I had missed the previous train by about 5 minutes. Moorgate Station is an underground station, but the overground trains depart and terminate there. The train that I need to catch always departs from one of two platforms 
that are in their individual tunnels, adjacent to one another, but accessible by foot as they are connected by paths that connect the platforms every 15 feet or so. I was sat on the bench right at the end, near where the front of the train would be departing. As I sat there I saw some movement in the corner of my eye, so I turned and stared to see just a regular guy dressed in dark clothing come through from the other platform passage about 10 metres from me and thought nothing of it. He went by the track, stared down, backed away and ran back through the passage to the other platform. I thought to myself that was weird and quickly got up to follow him and find out why he was running if he was okay. I was no more than five seconds behind him and the exit entry to the platform is right by the other end which was a good 150 metres or so away. As I go through the passage to the other platform I look to see no one there. I then went back to the other platform and again I was the only one there apart from a woman who just reached the bottom of the escalator to the platform entrance right down the other end. It was something I couldn't explain and I was sure I couldn't recall any footsteps that made it even weirder. London is an old place and has a lot of history so not sure if there was an event that could have reasoning to what I experienced but it's a memory that will always stick with me. Number 3 Although it's technically not an urban exploring, um, as a former electrician I think I can still share one moment from a job I had to do about 13 years ago. Me and my job partner were called out to a larger restoration job that was being done to an older house from the early 1900s. The house was still until this point a family owned house which had two owners since it was built and the last owner was an old lady who had passed away there whilst being the last person in her family line. It was a sad story on its own, but and nobody could take over the house. So the house got auctioned to a younger couple that bought it for an insane amount of money due to how large the house was. But it was now time to get the old house up to modern standards, which included a completely new installation from scratch. As the old cables around the house were the type of cables that was insulated with black cotton and fastened with handcrafted wooden clamps. While working in the first floor was quite easy as the entire installation process was made to fit inside the new wall frames that the carpenters were setting up. We eventually had to move on to the second floor and prepare for setting up a new intake from the attic which would then pass down to the new main fuse box on the second floor. We opened the hatch to the attic, and while using the flashlight to look up there, we could surely see that the attic was very cramped, so the smallest of us all would have to go up there to fix everything to get the intake cable settled while removing the old one. As you might guess, I was the smallest of us, and had to do that rubbish job of going up where nobody probably had been for many, many years so I decided to grab a lunch break and mentally prepare myself for what I expected to become a pretty rubbish job. After eating, I grabbed my flashlight and tool belt and started climbing up the stairs. And while climbing upwards, I noticed that the smell that we thought was pretty much old people smell as they die was getting increasingly stronger. But I had to continue, so I got to the top and crawled myself onto something stable when I got up, while noticing that the smell up there was pretty damn bad. So I grabbed my flashlight to look around and get somewhat orientated about where to crawl. Looking forward it seemed like a pretty straightforward route towards the intake point that I could see in the distance, but out of curiosity I wondered if there was anything else up here. So I looked to my right, only to light up five carcasses of what once was the old lady's cat that probably died. One of them were more or less intact, whilst being visibly partially eaten by various insects or whatever eats stuff, while two of them were more or less just rotten dried skin and bones. At that moment I absolutely regretted my decision to eat lunch, and the sight of along with the realisation about what I had smelled all along was these dead cats and I immediately threw up on the spot before very swiftly noping the hell out of there. 
After some talk back and forth, we came to the possibility that the old lady had been throwing her cats up there when they died. One by one. But we will never know for sure since the lady had died. The new owners had no idea about this when buying the house, but our company ended up denying to continue the work until the attic had been cleaned appropriately. This apparently took them about one month to complete. I guess there are not many companies who want to deal with that kind of nasty stuff. But my partner at work ended up finishing the work in the attic afterwards as he felt kind of bad for me. And then I decided not to continue being an electrician anymore, as this was not work I really enjoyed doing especially not after the event. Number 4 After the Community Care Act in Scotland in the early 90s, a lot of big sprawling long-stay mental hospitals were closed down and all the patients moved into smaller houses and homes spread out through the community. A lot of these old sites are still standing though. In Dundee we have a Strathmartin Hospital the core of which was constructed in the 1800s and expanded. Back in the day it was kind of the place you'd be sent if you were unwed mother or a bad child. The place was bought over to develop into flats, but the owner went bankrupt in the recession. So the whole site is standing there unprotected by security. Albeit surrounded by fences and kind of difficult to get to, me and a few friends had broken in a few times and it's hella creepy. Wards with beds and furniture perfectly presented. Wards with beds and furniture perfectly preserved. Old mass communal bathrooms, open loft shafts. Meds rooms with health posters and medication still there. Children's ward with child's pictures still on the wall decades later. Mental health wards with seclusion areas. Old crematorium, a gym and a swimming pool. People don't realise these hospitals were entirely self-contained communities. If there's interest, I can upload some pictures. A couple of stories though. On the children's ward, my friend who was filming, who's a bit of a spiritualist, said she felt a presence and got really anxious. I laughed it off, but when you play the video back, when she expresses that she feels something, the clip is all freakily distorted. Another story is when we were in the L-shaped building, I swear on my life, I heard whistling and footsteps coming round the corner. We quickly scrambled and hid, thinking security had found us. But no one was there. Number 5 I grew up in Frederick, Maryland back in the mid-90s to early 2000s when I was a teenager. The city still had a very rust belt vibe before a fairly recent revival into a hipster infested douche mecca. It had a fairly large blue collar presence, particularly along the city's open air drainage canal, which back when I was growing up was flanked on both sides by tons of abandoned or condemned buildings, both residential and industrial. Now it's all sushi fusion joints, hilariously overpriced condos and vintage thrift shops like every other city in the east coast. Anyway, back then we would roam around the city and break into abandoned buildings for fun. Sometimes we'd vandalise the place but usually we would just explore and use them as hangout spots when we could drink and smoke weed without having to worry about cops. There were a bunch of creepy moments particularly when you'd break into a condemned house only to discover that one or more homeless people had set up in there. My city kind of had a bad reputation for having a lot of severely mentally ill homeless people back then, paranoid schizophrenics and such, a bunch of whom I knew by name back then. One memory that stands out though was an abandoned house we broke into which had clearly been vacant for many years, with visible black mould growing on the walls. It was weird, because it had clearly been occupied by a family previously because of all their stuff was still there. Like the rapture happened and they just disappeared. Beds, dressers with clothes, family photos on the walls, all of that. We didn't dare open the fridge. It really seemed like for some reason the family drove away one day and just never returned. It was super creepy 
walking through their home with flashlights and just getting this rotted glimpse into their lives before whatever happened. I want to thank you all for listening, if you in fact made it this far. I am starting to get things more organised again with work, so I hope to have more uploads sorted for the future weeks. Um, and I do apologise, maybe some of these stories weren't quite our big stories, um, I find them quite difficult to come by. Um, but like I said, if you have any of your own, please do submit them to me. There's a website down below as well as an email address you can submit your stories to. Um, but as always, I hope to see you all in the next one. And I hope you all have a pleasant evening. Thank you.